All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the first event of the Race and Revolution lecture series. Um, let me let me introduce you, Sky. How's that work? Yeah, please do. So, hello, um, and as Sky just said, welcome to uh, what I think is a, a, a the first of what I, I hope will be an extremely exciting uh, series. Uh, that at least will go through November and may actually continue into next semester called Race and Revolution, um, a, a lecture series uh, designed to ask, I think, uh, an important question of what are we fighting for uh, in this new civil rights movement? Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm, I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College and um, thrilled to be able to work with um, one of our Hannah Arendt Center fellows, um, uh, uh, Sky Carter, who uh, over the summer, Sky and I talked a number of times about what was going on and thought about what we at Bard and the Arendt Center could do um, as a way to respond to um, uh, both the, the tragedies that were going on, but also the, the, the civil rights movement that was beginning. And, um, and so uh, this, this series, which uh, tonight is the kickoff event for, uh, was the result of that. Um, let me just introduce Sky, and, 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 and she's going to then introduce the uh, illustrious panel of um, Bard uh, students and, and, and a few faculty members um, who are going to, to get this thing going. Sky is a, a junior. Uh, human rights major and written arts major at Bard. Um, as she describes it, she's born at the intersection of multiple identities. Um, and she is involved in a number of clubs at Bard. Um, the POC Theater Ensemble, the WOCU, and the Race Monologues, alongside a leadership position with Queer People of Color Group. Um, and uh, she's been a student fellow at the Hannah Arendt Center uh, for the last year plus, and I'm thrilled uh, to be working with her on this lecture series. So Sky, I'll turn it over to you and let you get this first event going. Thank you so much for that illustrious um, introduction, Roger. I really appreciate it. Um, well, before we start, I wanna say first, can we have all of our audience members who are not the speakers to turn off their video? I don't want people to get confused on where well, speakers are. Sky, let me just add one thing. If, if people do want to ask questions, there's two ways to do it. But the main way is to put something into the chat. And I'm going to be monitoring the chat. And I will bring those questions to Sky's attention and to the panelists' attention. So the chat is the easiest way to, to ask questions. Exactly. And I think the way we'd like this to work is for the first hour or so to be our questions to our incredible panel and then 30 minutes at the end for all of you, our incredible audience, to ask questions and weigh in on the questions that I'm giving to our panelists. Um, I, for one, am particularly excited about this particular group. I'm friends with all of you, but I also look up to all of you immensely. Um, and so to start, I would like to introduce each of them. Um, so to begin, we have Nike Fabier, who is the chair of the Student Athletics Diversity Committee and a Title IX coordinator. Um, she's incredible. She's also incredible in the volleyball field. You should see her. <laughs> we also have the infamous Talia Robinson Dancy, <laughs> who is the leader of the Black Body Experience, co founder of Black Talks, and co head, um, but stepping down this year, unfortunately, of Women of Color United, of which I am a member and proudly united. Um, we have Bernadette Benjamin, otherwise known as Bernie, who is also a co-founder of Black Talks and a Bard alumni. Um, while she was here, she's, you studied in Japanese and Asia, East Asian studies, correct? Um, Sociology, but I did a lot um, of work with the Asian uh, population. Because mm, Bernie is dope. <laughs> and yeah. Um, Bernie is also very cool, someone who's worked with a lot of incredible speakers in the past as well. Um, and yeah, and alongside Bernie and Talia, there is also Sage Swaby, who is not a panelist tonight, but who also co-founded the um, Black Talks. We have Teron Bird, 
who is um, another co-leader of the Black Body Experience and the head of Black Student Organization, um, which I think is pretty cool to have on your resume. <laughs> and then we have the one, the only speaker of the student body, Adrian Costa, um, who is also the co-head of Bard Musical Theater Ensemble. Um, and I think for now that should be everyone, right? Yes, okay. So before I start this panel, just a little bit more um, about the series. We have, so this is the Race and Revolution Lecture Series, as you heard Roger talk about that we've been working on since the summer. Um, really, we're trying to answer questions as to what we want from a liberation movement. What does Black liberation look like? What does an end goal look like for the Floyd protests, for the incurring protests for racial justice that we're seeing to this day? Um, and that is a big question. And so we wanted to ask that first of our own community before we end up asking that to the rest of our speakers in this series, which we have a lot of incredible speakers, including Jenna Wortham of Still Processing, Linda Villarosa of the New York Times, Kimberly Foster of the incredible um, YouTube series for Harriet, and many more on the docket. So we hope you guys stick around. Um, and now, if you guys are done hearing me talk, let's get into it. <laughs> so first and foremost, I have a couple questions for you all, which you can answer at your leisure. Um, sorry, let me pull these up really quick. So first and foremost, I want to ask, since we've had about three weeks into the semester thus far, for you all, for those of you who are students and not students, have you felt the effects of the present and past summer protests for racial justice in your day to day, either at BARD or your work environment or elsewhere, and how? Take your time, don't worry. <laughs> Yeah, Adrian. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm gonna be the first one. Um, yeah, but like Sky said, um, my name's Adrian and I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, and I think that a lot of what I've noticed, and maybe this is just because of my uh, certain interests, um, has been a lot from white people. Um, I think for people of color or BIPOC or Black people, a lot, of, a, a lot of what the experience of this movement has been is not an articulation of, of um, you know, the experience of being uh, violently, you know, um, violently murdered in the streets by police officers, but, uh, a mandate that is now given to to uh, people of color to articulate that to the powers that be. Um, so nothing about the experience or the way that we have been articulating that experience has changed. I think for white people, um, it has been terrifying um, because they have been asked in the isolation of their, you know, of um, of coronavirus, of, 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 you know, quarantine. They have been asked to be agents of thought and change among themselves um, and to, to be interested and invested in the question of racial equity. Um, and there's been a lot of reactions to that. There's been uh, reactions of apathy and and detachment. There's been anger, and there's also been complete um, submission. Um, and so I I guess for me, I I think it's really compelling to look at um, a lot of you know my white peers, but also just in general, like white people on a social on on a larger scale, like how they choose to do everything but 
confront the question of race with courage and honesty. Um, I'm curious what everyone else thinks. Um, and also, maybe that's just me. Maybe I just like to um, turn the mirror around to, you know, our white peers um, because they are always, I mean, there's always been a tradition of white people studying people of color. Um, and I guess maybe I'm just a contrarian like that. Um, I do not know. Um, but yeah, that's what it means to me. I can go next, yeah. Um, so I get nervous when speaking, so I'm not gonna code switch, so hang, so hang on tight, y'all. But basically, um, what I've noticed since I've been back on campus, one, I feel very grateful to be around other Black people um, who kind of understand my feelings around this, because being at home, like, my mother kind of understood, um, and my grandparents kind of understood, but it's just not the same as to be with people of your own generation who kind of understand like kind of the lens that you're looking through for this. So that's definitely been something um, that has made me feel more at home and a little bit less anxious around certain situations. Um, but I will say um, having conversations with faculty and staff about how to, how can Bard um, decolonize or unpack all of the institutional racism has definitely um, been the same. Um, it's also like they're they're pushing it everywhere. I've noticed with a lot of the first year students who are white, they seem like they want to talk to more black people now so they can have the black friends in their group. Like they're just, they seem really passionate about talking to us now, which I've never seen in my four years of being here, which I think is a good and a bad thing. Cause it's like, are you doing this to be performative? Or are you doing it because you genuinely want to diversify your friend group? Um, so I would question people to challenge why they want to have black friends, um, but also, in the conversations like there, Adrian was in this meeting about the banners of saying Black Lives Matter and hate has no home here or no hate zone. I can't remember the language that they chose to go with, but I think a lot of times faculty think it's the best thing to say that instead of actually having action plans to show that Black lives do matter. Um, and I'm not with the performative bullshit. So I was clearly like, we're not gonna do this um, because hate does have a home here. We see it every day. Um, and if my black lives matter, if my black life matters, you need to show me um, rather than having a sign. Um, so I think that's something that's definitely been there. And also just, it's an election year um, going into the neighboring towns, Red Hook, Kingston, um, Tivoli. It has also been a thing. I actually got into an altercation in Kingston with myself and another friend who was a black man um, because someone thought it was appropriate to approach us in Walmart and be like, these people think they can do whatever they want. Um, and it was just, it was, it was a very interesting thing um, to see um, just because, you know, Kingston is kind of, painted as this liberal space, but you know, they have like the, the Trump rallies and the Blue Lives Matter rallies all there. So I think just navigating the world right now as a black person, one in a pandemic and then in an election year, and also just dealing with this new movement of people, you know, fighting for us to be humanized. Um, it has definitely been a time. And I think um, just adjusting to it every day has been something that has impacted my mental health greatly, but has also made me realize um, the type of person I want to be and the type of things I want to do, you know, after Bard. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people forget that the protests also made Black folk a lot more visible, for better or for worse. I know even when I first moved to Red Hook, people started clapping for me when I was going to Hannaford's <laughs> for my groceries. Um, but then on the way home, people start honking at me. So it is like this weird duality of like ex pushing, I guess, those who are not Black to extremities of how they deal with Black folk. Um, I saw a hand up from Bernie Benjamin. Hi, yeah, so I'm um, the only one uh, on this panel who's actually not at Bard. I'm at home in Brooklyn. Um, but what I've seen has been more international. So I know that we're talking about America and we're talking about white people coming out of this bubble of thinking that racism does not exist. And it's like, oh, wait, oh my God, it does exist, right? But it's really fascinating to see white people in another country, um, or as well as um, Asians, 
particularly East Asian, because that's what I focus on, so particularly Japan, and seeing how a lot of conversations on the global scale or on the international scale are saying that racism is only a thing in America. And being like, oh, like this is an American thing. We're showing solidarity in Germany. We're showing solidarity in Japan and Korea. And we're like, yes, Black lives do matter. And then they forget that, hey, actually, y'all are also um, part participating and perpetuating racism in your own country. And so thinking about like, how does this look like? I, I don't know if a lot of y'all know about Naomi Osaka, but she is a biracial Japanese individual who also plays tennis. Um, and she's bringing awareness um, about, black, about black lives in Japan. And uh, there's this kind of similar to what Sage, not Sage, Sky was saying in terms of like the duality, sorry, um, about the duality of, you know, one moment they love you, next moment they don't. And so that's kind of a similar thing that a lot of bi black biracial individuals face, but even on the other scale um, of just black individuals navigating another country like Japan, um, and having similar racism being thrown at them, I can't say it's the same thing because white racism does look different and it does come from a different source, but navigating a, a different space while still having your black identity as a marker in a similar way or in a similar vein as it is in America. So having those conversations with people who are in another country and having these conversations with them in terms of like, how does racism look like in your neighborhood in Japan or in your neighborhood in France and thinking about what you can do there as opposed to just bringing awareness about um, racism in America because it, it racism is global now um so we can't just focus only on America um because yes you know we are in America and it's our focal point but as we navigate the world we got to think about like okay there are other people who look like us but are experiencing similar things and we also want to be in solidarity with them as we want them to be in solidarity with us so there's been a lot for me I haven't necessarily like done a lot of like action plans but i've been a part of a lot of conversations about how does the global world perpetuate racism and, and how does it look like and how does it deviate from what we think about in america that was an incredible answer bernie and i feel like that could be like its own panel honestly what does non-white racism look like because i don't think we talk about that um lastly i think does Toronto and nikkei want to weigh in nikkei Sure, I can weigh in. Um, this summer, I really had to sit with how angry I was. And definitely, because like normally for the most part, I tend to try and like not seem as though and to not kind of like fall into what my, what some people might call like the angry black woman type, but I am an angry black woman. Like I, and I genuinely just need to be okay with that. And then coming to Bard, I've had multiple conversations with administrators, professors and other people just to let them know I am angry, I will continue to be angry if nothing happens. And I think a lot of the goals, at least for me for this semester, and at least working um, as the chair of the Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity SAC committee, as well as serving on a council to better improve Bard Athletics, because let's call it what it is, Bard Athletics is a, is a perpetrator of a lot of the racism that does go on on campus. We gotta call it what it is. I've been doing my best and I want to continue to do my best to hold the administration accountable because there's nothing else I can do because at this point, like me doing that for, at least for me is the least amount of labor that I can do before it becomes emotional labor where then they need to pay me. But other than that, I've really just been trying to sit with and hold people accountable and hold myself accountable because like sometimes that can be very difficult, especially right now when like a lot of things are happening and like, I have just kind of been doing a lot of work of trying to just make sure that like, just commute, like bettering the community and trying to make sure that places and spaces are actually safe for people and not just like Talia was saying, saying having a sign that's put up to kind of like give a message of inclusivity when that actual inclusive work is not happening behind the scenes, especially on an administrative level where they are trying to push all these things out. So definitely this summer was I'm just trying to grapple with like my righteous anger because I'm pissed as hell. Like not to say like, like that's just how I, like that's just how I feel. So that's kind of where, what I've been looking at and like what I've been kind of examining like through myself and how to bring that to Bard in a way that it can actually be constructive. Yeah, I think Audre Lorde would also really agree with you. But I think anger, 
for all of us, I think has been like a really productive mode that I don't think a lot of people really think about or outside of the black community. That like anger is a motivator, anger gets shit done. And I'm glad to see that you're actually doing that work, Nikkei. It's really inspiring. Um, yeah, last but not least. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Tehran. Pronouns he, him. Um, I think that for me, can you hear me right? Can you hear me? Um, I, I think my day-to-day more so looks like wellness checks and ideas of mental health within Black people, you know what I mean? Because I don't really interact with white people, um, whatever. And so um, I specifically, like, really try to focus on, like, creating welcoming and safe environments for Black people specifically, because I feel like um, even though all of us on this panel are extremely, like, intelligent people and, like, we're revolutionaries in our own right, like, I think that what happens is that we often forget about, one, ourselves and how exactly we deal with our anger, like Nikkei said, or, like, um, the duality of our positions within our community, and then also, like, the way in which we respond to the world outside of us. And then also people that are just not revolutionaries, because there are Black people that don't really care about like being on the front lines, you know what I mean? Or like are willing and happy with just giving support. And I think that, um, I think that's probably the most prioritization of kind of like black joy that I've been trying to, I guess, push through my day to day. Cause I think that specifically this summer and everything that was happening was like, it's like when you're black, you just, this is just your life, you know what I mean? Like you see it over and over and over again. So there's nothing really, you're not like, oh, like there's so many protests going on. Like, no girl, like this just happens every day, all day. You know what I mean? But like, I think that what is unique is that when black people sit down and say, my black joy comes first, my black joy is revolution. And I think that is probably at least the way in which I feel like these protests have influenced the my day-to-day or at least influence the way in which I interact with other people in my work environments like I'm not going to put on things that like I know is going to make me more stressed out because I'm already dealing with my position as a black person a black queer person as a black person on this campus and like just so many layers that I'm like you know my mental health comes first so that makes sense no yeah and that shouldn't be overlooked I think that is really, really important, especially as I have all of you here as leaders on campus and leaders beyond campus. And I feel like a situation such as this, like with all the protests that it really forces you into your body, like being in the extreme of watching violence upon black folk every day and to the point where you can't avoid it on all social media platforms amongst your friends, amongst other people, you have to sit in your body and feel like, shit, I need, I need help. I do need, I need to focus on my joy. I need to focus on my happiness because I'm not getting that anywhere else. It is a really good reminder in that way. And I appreciate you bringing that perspective. Thank you all. Those are, I feel like I want to talk about each subject that you all brought up. You all brought very different facets to the movement of minds. Um, but I think, all right, I have another question for you all with that in mind. Um, So since you all are leaders, as I just said, um, do you all have any ideas for programming an institution or a new environment that has not yet been created or put into practice widely that would contribute to your personal vision for a liberated society for Black folk or liberated school environment for Black folk? I know Nikkei spoke a little bit about trying to keep the pressure on administration or to make that happen for herself within athletics. But um, for everyone else, I know we're all a part of very different institutions and part of different arms of BARD. So I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts. I'm seeing smiles. Any hands? Please, speaker. Tilia, please go ahead. Please go ahead, Tilia, please. Um, I don't know. And I think about this, (laughs) 
I think about this all the time because I feel like when I got the label of student leader, because that's not something I consider myself, I'm just a person who cares and just does things. Um, I don't know, but I know it's not the responsibility of black and brown people to keep putting our labor into it because we're not the ones who created this problem. Like whenever a racist person is like, go back to Africa, I'm like, please give me the money so I can go and tell me which tribe I came from because I will happily go back. Um, because at the end of the day, like like I said, we're not the ones who created this problem. I'm not the one um, who's actively trying to hold up um, institutional racism. I understand that it's ingrained in me because I grew up in a society and you know I still live in America, but I'm actively trying to unlearn things every day. And I give people the resources all the time um, to unlearn things and to question why they think about the things that they do. Um, so for me, unless I'm doing it out of my own volition, um, I just, I don't know, I'm tired of really putting my labor um, into a place where it seems like they still want to uphold certain ideals and have it under the framework um, that they're not, because at the end of the day, like, time tells all. Um, and, you know, with Black at Bar being a you can see alum from two years ago, they're like, damn, this shit is still happening? And, you know, so at the end of the day, like, it's, it's not our responsibility um, to really try to undo these things because like, like I said at the end of the day like we're not really the ones actively giving into it like we're trying to make change so we have to put the pressure on administration as Nikkei was saying to keep undoing these things. Um, yeah yeah no I'm gonna yeah I yeah you're I mean it's kind of interesting um, that you talk about like student leader or whatever, because I feel like, you know, you go to club head day and you look around and what do you see? You see people of color because people of color run this campus because people of color do not have a choice as to whether or not they have to mobilize or not. Um, they just do. And like that and like, the or like this impulse to just do stuff and to just make an impact like that that consciousness is always you know ingrained into people of color and so while you know you know most if not all white students have the luxury of kind of uh existing you know in a mundane way like people of color especially on this campus don't have that luxury um you know, I'm, you know, I agree with them and I'm, and you're right. Like I am just someone who s speaks their truth. And for some reason, <laughs> y'all gave me a couple titles and told me to, and I sent a couple emails and suddenly I'm the speaker of the student body. And it's like, what is <laughs> like, you know, like, okay, like, great. Like, give me my check. Um, but to go back to this question, uh, Sky, about programming, I think <laughs> this is something that I've learned a lot um, over the past summer and over, you know, after these protests of, you know, George Floyd, is that white people finally gave us the permission to kind of um, do this work, um, which is really, you know, like it's a really uh, grand opportunity, I guess. Um, but for me, um, I'm someone who is an idealist um, and or a humanist, you can call it whatever you like. And, but I like to give space uh, and energy to thinking, actually like having thoughtful conversations about the work that we're doing. And I think that a lot of that gets uh, pushed aside when we talk about, when we start talking about process and programming and like actually insti uh, instituting um, change. And so, um, you know, an example of this is um, I'm, as a speaker, I'm sitting on the Presidential Commission on Racial Equity. Um, and I, you know, obviously a, a commission like that has a very um, focused goal, you know, to address, to diagnose, audit, and address, uh, you know, you know, racial equity issues on campus, which essentially is a long-winded way of saying, like, how does it feel to be a Black person or a person of color on this campus? You know, that is the simple question. Um, and to me, I wanted to, you know, my impulse was to take this on like a very theoretical level to think about, okay, like 
we're doing this commission at a college, but we're not recognizing that like the collegiate system is ingrained uh, in institutional racism. We're not recognizing that like the process by which we're going through this by collecting data and auditing and and you know you know creating documentation like how that lets you know the actual information kind of slip through the stories the experiences you know the livelihoods of people of color and you know i was sitting in a room with like 30 you know really successful you know well known faculty members professors staff people who had taught me about what it meant to really think about the ways racism has infected everything. Um, and then our imp the first impulse was to talk about data and crime statistics and how the crime statistics are not telling, are telling us that, you know, there's actually, we have lower crime rates, you know, or lower uh, crimes reported that are like hate crimes. And it's like, well, the experience, it, like the, da the data might be saying one thing, but I know for a fact that there have been dozens of dozens of experiences of students being harassed, attacked on campus. And so this is a very real thing, you know? And so I guess for me, um, when I think about programming, I really, I feel like I kind of assume the role where I'm like, okay, everyone, like, let's all remember to give each other space to actually think about, you know, the work that we are doing. What does it actually mean to audit this campus? What does it actually mean to think about uh, anti-racism in theater or in sociology or in math? Like, because it's there, it is there. We just need to give ourselves space to think about it and to ask the right questions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and like, you know, that is a hard thing to do, but I think only when we, you know, give ourselves that space, um, can actual progress be made? Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Honestly, I think I'm gonna save all of my comments and questions for the end. So Tehran, you've had your hand up for a minute. Um, I feel like the question of like programming and institutions and like, it all like references reform. And I think that maybe this is like based on your personal politics of like, anti-racism, anti-black racism, like white supremacy within like space, like white spaces. And I personally don't see any change. That's, that's terrible, but I don't see any like shift of ideology without the destruction of the institutions that already exist. You know what I mean? So like the idea that like BARD or like any PWI can systemically change is like something that I don't know, just like brings up laughter for me. Like it's because of the fact that it's like, it's like referencing and talking to specifically the idea that like, oh, people that enter these spaces are the problem rather than the space itself. And I think that like, you know, as like, as a student leader, whatever the hell that means, like that, the idea that you, like the, the idea that the school puts on you that you are someone that has to shift and change your environment because the idea that like, well, you're a black person in this space where like this space was created to oppress you is funny. Like I, I really, I genuinely think that like when you sent us the question before, I literally wrote my book, come back to that. Cause like, it's, it's literally like, what is there to say? Because at one point we're, it's like, we're starting to like try to have a conversation about the idea of something not being terrible when in reality like the conversation we should be having is okay let's get rid of this terrible system and implement something else with whether or not these student leaders or people that are black that are non-white want to be in leaders like positions of leadership you know what I mean and that choice should be given but I also think that I don't know like there's no conceivable program because if any program that you can think of, or not any, but most programs at BARD that are centered towards creating safe spaces for people of color, just any marginalized group probably exists at BARD already. But the thing is that like, the problem's not the programs, the problem is BARD. You know what I mean? Like the problem is 
the space in which we're trying to shift. And I think to me, there's no way to shift that space until you actually talk to each and every single individual and shift the way they think. And that's unrealistic and impossible. But, you know, that was a nice question. <laughs> I really appreciate that answer and that call out. I do appreciate that, that you felt like the, the question itself seemed to like point toward reform. And I think honestly, like part of it is I wanted a fancy word for radical imagination. And I used a lot of words in that. Um, so I kind of actually want to reframe the question if I'm allowed. Um, it was more towards, because I thought what would be even scarier, because my first draft of that question is like, how would you feel, in what position would you feel most comfortable? Like, what is your personal utopia? Which is a lot bigger than asking, oh, what programs or institutions would you like to have in place? Because also, as Talia said, like, you did say that it's not up to you to have that imagination for what you would like out of your institution mm -hmm. but at the same time shouldn't we have an imagination for what we want out of our own joy like how we could live our life like what what type of life do we want not within the bounds of any of the systems that we're a part of if that's what you think or for others I guess some people who do believe in reform um what is the life that you want for yourself like what is when you, when you imagine yourself at your most happy at your most happiest, what is it? What is there? What allows for you to be your most happiest? To be your most comfortable? For you to not have to do the work that you have to do simply because you're black in this world, honestly. Um, so yeah, I don't. I, that's a larger question, and probably something I just, I just should have wrote, wrote that to begin with. So I apologize. <laughs> um, but okay, I, I'm gonna point at Bernie. Didn't you have your hand up? Never mind. <laughs> I mean, yes and no, because I feel like you kind of answered the question. Because like what I was gonna say was just be able to live without having to like have my blackness be my identity. But that like, I'd rather have like, Bernadette as my identity as opposed to all these add-ins you know like oh I'm queer I'm black I'm able-bodied I'm I use these pronouns da, 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 da. like being able to exist in the world as who you are and not having to define yourself because once you define yourself you get to figure out what box you're in and then by what box you're in you get to figure out like how you then have to navigate and thinking about the trauma that has come with that box right um, so that's the first thing that came to my, my mind in terms of just like thinking about if we were to abolish all these like institutions and these systems is be once we do that, then we that's why I'll feel liberated, where I don't have to be like, I'm Bernadette and da da da. It's just I'm Bernadette, I'm a human being. And I don't think we're at a space now. I know I've talked to other people who think that we're at that space where we could just eliminate it. But I don't think we're at that space now where I can just say Bernadette and you're not you're not seeing me in addition to all these other identities um but i also agree with Teron. like it was it, i had a hard time answering the original question but like thinking about the new question a new formulated question the simple thing that i could say and i probably have to come back to it is just being able to live as me yeah nike um so a little bit to address your old question and your new one i think Black people, POC, I think we have suggested the programming that we wanted. And to Adrian's point that like, now they're finally giving us the permission to actually work on it. And also I think it's kind of funny and hypocritical that they're giving us the permission, but still the lack of funding to actually work on these things. So like, I just think it's interesting how like, this the campus does run purely off of POC labor and the fact that like now this can't like the campus is basically trying to grapple and struggle to figure out what it might look like if POCs act because like all of us are tired like I, I, I can speak to myself I'm tired and like what this campus might look like if actually POC decided to take a break because now they want to make all these commissions now they want to make all these committees now they want to do all these things because they're realizing that people that they call student leaders who basically 
did all the work and the labor while they were here for their court, like for their period of time, are leaving. So now they're trying to basically rope new people in. As well as to your new question, like I can't help but think of like Hegel's master slave theory, where basically like you're looking at like you can't see like basically right now we're working with you can't see yourself without someone else's perception and i think that's and basically everyone is almost trying to make themselves somehow like superior to others and i think like what like like what bernie was saying like i would like to just go into a classroom and not be afraid of what the professor might see what am i look like cuz i've had multiple comments about what my face looks like how that changes the space and like i would just like to live like shit i just want to like be able to like go to class sit there enjoy myself instead of worrying about one of my what one of my dumb classmates might say you know like i want to be able to like go to klein eat and not worry about what someone might be recording or doing or saying about black people on the side i want to be able to walk in the gym and not feel afraid to do what i like to lift, to be in these spaces. And I think similar, like when Tehran was bringing up, how do you, like, how do the oppressed make space for themselves in spaces that are just inherently oppressive? It's difficult without, I don't want to say abolish, but like, I chose my words. Like, you know, so. Uh, Yes, Talia, please. Yeah, so I'm in no means in favor of like a homogenous society because I do believe having diversity is something that makes the world prettier. But at this point, if you ask my ideal society, I just want to take all the Black women, the Black films, the Black non-boys, get us a little plot of land and move. Like, you know, that's one right episode where he's like, what if we take all of us to push us over there? Like, at this point, that's kind of where I am. Um, because um, <laughs> I had a lot of conversations um, with my friends about this over the summer, but I just, we're, we're tired. I'm tired. And I think after, you know, Toyin was murdered and just like the reaction to that and then seeing that she was murdered by a black man and she was so full of life and she was so young, I, that was like the breaking point for me. And I was just like, at, at one point in America, are we going to be appreciated? You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of the protests did center around George Floyd, because like his black life mattered. People cared when he died, but yet we still hear about Breonna Taylor. Now she just become, be, has become a martyr and like uh, something to post on social media. And that's not right. Um, so to me, I, my ideal society and for me to be happy right now would just be to take all of us to put us in a plot of land away from everyone where we could be safe, where we could be appreciated and where we can be loved. I want to go. <laughs> Genuinely, that sounds beautiful. <laughs> Um, But what I'm gathering, just in general, also from what you're saying and from being Black, (laughs) is that um, the present protests really haven't changed our conscious realities that much. Um, We were all doing this work prior. We're all doing this work after. And I mean, I I can't measure this, but I don't, I hope we're closer to like that plot of land where we can roam free. But I don't, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads and that's kind of sad, (laughs) incredibly so. But I think, um, was there a hand up from Adrian or did I miss that? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, um, what is, I mean, I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna have the crazy opinion um, and say that I think that there's something in this world worth fighting for, I really do. And I think that it does not come without a cost. Um, It really does not. Um, But I think that there is something that people of color uh, or black people have that is, uh, that is something, it's about truth. It's like, there's a truth that black people understand that that white people just don't get, um, that I think was, is, is born out of uh, this long history of, of struggle. Um, 
that I think that I think is the most essential, the most essentially human thing, you know. Um, and I think that that takes energy and that takes cause. Um, but I think that there is some that that is what utopia is um, is embracing that um, principle. But um, yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. And I think that, I also think that to your point, Teron, like I really appreciated you saying that, um, you know, for you, like your energy, you know, is best served from coming from you to build places of happiness at, for black people, you know? And I think that that is so, like that is so valuable. And I think that for me, like, you know, everyone has every every everyone has their own thing that they can like devote this like, you know, energy towards and this and this emotion and this 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 feeling towards that I think is so valuable. And you know, for me, it might be like I have a you know specific affinity to like, you know, studying you know whiteness and studying that. And then maybe you know you Tehran like you you have a uh, specific affinity towards building black joy and like building like uh an experience for black people that is that is full of love and full of joy and full of happiness and i think that in those in those impulses we can work towards a future you know a future with each other um because i don't want all the black femmes to leave <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah i don't know if that makes sense <laughs> yeah, until I said bye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. That's all I'm gonna say right now. Um, but yeah. Um, does anybody want to respond to that idea? Sorry, I see you trying. Um, I, I think that. with what Adrian said, like, and, okay. The first part of what Adrian said, specifically about the idea that, like, there is hope and the idea of hope being kind of our motivation to, like, you know, build uh, a better future. And, and I think that on one hand, I feel like Black people have always had that, like, that um double layer of consciousness you know what i mean like the idea that like what we're fighting for what we're like the idea of creating black spaces that are mainly meant for black people to just enjoy themselves like every single person on this panel like every single person um has contributed to that on this campus 110 percent. you know what i mean but i think that i feel like there's a point in which you kind of recognize that all your work that you that you do is kind of like kind of going into this vacuum if that makes sense like the in the, the space of bard is the vacuum like the idea that despite every single initiative you create every committee that you make like there is the idea of your oppression means someone else's success or someone else's um validation whether that is for black femmes and black women specifically, like their oppression helps validate black men on this campus. Or like if that's for black students, black and brown students, our oppression helps validate the space that white students occupy on this campus. And I think that if we're just speaking about Bard, um, because an island sounds cute, I love an island, um, you know, a tropical one, uh, but I think that specifically on this campus and in the world, like it's hard to kind of remove the the layer and the destruction that history has done. You know what I mean? Like the idea that like we can fight for something, but there's always going to be outliers. So there's always going to be like systems that can be created based on like someone else's idea of what the perfect utopia looks like. That's why for me personally, I'm scared of black men getting in leadership. And I feel that sounds so bad, but like, I think that there are every group of people that are in positions of power have some type of like ideologies, like has some type of ideology that is oppressive to someone else. And so the idea of like a utopia or like the idea of like 
the hope it's kind of like um i feel like that can only really be seen is if you destroy everything because there's nothing like of value or there's nothing of specific joy that you can like liberate towards when you can acknowledge that like every single person has something to unlearn or every single space has something to unlearn you know what i mean does that make sense okay yeah it absolutely makes sense thank you and i think more nike wants to continue um like when thinking about that and thinking about utopias i just don't think that like a perfect utopia can be given like i don't think that i can necessarily like be given this space because i still feel like if like if there was like a random part of the united states that did get cut off for like for literally for black femmes there still will be an inherent power structure because we are still working under the united states and we are still and that's something that they were given to them like i just tend like i don't know that's why like i get so and especially on bard's campus where like a space was given for POC to feel free and the fact that it is still not properly funded it is still not given like the chance that it deserves it's still almost being controlled because it was given to us it wasn't something that we were able to necessarily take so like when thinking of a utopia I I can't think of one that's just inherently given I think of one that's taken ripped because like I think of places that were utopias, like Tulsa, like Rose, like Rosewood, they were burned down. Like they were destroyed because an inherent power structure that was created like from the absolute jump from them. So like, I don't know if I can, that's why I'm very skeptical about like what it, like what it means to, to work towards a utopia that just isn't outright taken. Yeah, it does run, we're running a very interesting, like, conflict here with how Nike is saying, like, that space can't, Nike and Tehran, honestly, both saying that that space can't really be given, and that also somebody else's utopia, somebody else's dystopia, Um, especially since we still live within, within capitalism, which allowed for the subjugation of Black bodies to begin with, um, and so then it kind of also reminds me of ideas of, like, Black capitalism and how that's not the way to go (laughs) um we're truly trying to create a future that is without subjugation but at the same time it also runs against the idea that like um that talaya brought up earlier that it's not a responsibility to create um new systems that have been it's not our responsibility to do the work that our oppressors have done in order to oppress us you know It's not our responsibility to take up the mantle of putting in all this extra labor in order to create these spaces that are, like Nike said, already underfunded and undersupported. Um, And so it does feel like actually my last, it, it leans into my last question for you all, which was in the case of BARD, honestly, institutions like BARD, reform or abolition, Um, And I think I already know what your answers are in some regard, but um, but yeah, I think it does beg the question of like, because Tehran also mentioned that it does feel like all the work that you do becomes in a vacuum because that's the way the the institution, at least the college institution works. You have four years here and you put in all of your, literally all your time and labor for you to just leave and then not be remembered and all of that work be there for the next people that come in who then have to continue reinventing the wheel because the black students that created those things prior are no longer here, um, which just extends to like a larger system in which that happens on an institutional scale everywhere. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a daunting question. It's a daunting thing to consider what even what next looks like. Um, but yeah. Like, sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but the question at the end before we get into questions from our audience is reform or abolition for you all in an ideal world. 
burn everything down. Um, I, I really take all your points. Um, and I really, I mean, I'm, you know, I really appreciate them. And I'm really stuck on, uh, Sky, your question of, you know, the question, the, like, white people, you know, messed it up, <laughs> you know, they messed it up. Um, and it is not the responsibility of black people to clean that mess up. Um, but then I guess it begs the question of like, well, what now in, in like sitting in that mess? And I think that this is kind of where the, uh, the, the kind of, um, separation is, is like either you kind of de destroy everything and start anew, or you choose to, um, reform. And I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. All I can all I can do is uh, speak, is is offer my energy um, to everyone here and to everyone on this campus and to everyone in my life, and um, speak truth to power and like speak um, truth on my experience and lead with love and lead with uh, an energy that is about building, um, because I think the answer the answer to this question. Uh, and when confronted with hate and uh, violence and destruction is to love. And that is an extremely hard thing to do. Um, so is that an answer? I do not know. I don't know. And maybe it's just because I'm a theater major and I'm all like, ooh, like love, 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 whatever, whatever. But I think that's my answer. I understand this is a large question and I think even it's hard to answer too because I think even like to call myself out here I've just asked all of you to come put labor into a panel to talk about your experiences being black at an institution which you've done and talked about for the past four years longer honestly since we've all been people of color for longer than our time at college um, and I do I do worry about like the answer to that question if there is not an answer to that question because that does mean in some regard like because I I see that in reform that means more conversations like this which you kind of hope that there aren't personally that like I don't continue to have to put you all into a room and exhume your trauma for the point of white people understanding or whoever in a space of power understanding and doing something marginal about it. Um, and the alternative is like Talia says, burn it all down, which those really aren't, it's hard because also like those two answers aren't necessarily extremes of each other in the slightest because we are, we're here, it's 2020. We've been on this land for over 400 years. Our ancestors have been doing this. Our parents have been doing this. Our grandparents have been doing this. Um, so an answer is hard, it's scary, absolutely. Um, I don't expect you all to fix everything, but I do appreciate you all being in conversation with me today, regardless. But um, yeah, the question still stands if you want to answer it. If not, we can definitely go into questions from our audience. I see there's fingers coming up for Bernie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm also struggling with the answer to this question because I'm also thinking about two different communities. I'm thinking about America, but I'm also thinking about Japan. So sorry if I'm annoying anybody. But I'm also, because I'm thinking about like, as a black person in a non-Western country, like what would abolition look like? You know what I mean? Like, especially if I'm not, especially in an Asian country that has their own culture, their own history, and then also their own relationship to uh, white supremacy or whiteness that is different from black um, or black people. So it's really interesting for me to think about like, how would I, 
if I'm thinking in an abolitionist mindset, how would I navigate that space and bring up abolition, which is where for me, it was like maybe reform at least the beginning stages is the route to go. Um, and then reform leading up to abolition. I don't know. I'm just like, spinning things in my head. I have to actually think more about it. Um, Cause what I did this entire summer is just basically try to educate myself on like different forms of abolition, um, different forms of what people think about like revolutionary practices um, and is abolition revolutionary, like things like that, like these kind of questions. So I'm not necessarily 100% sure of my own answer, but in terms of America, I used to lean towards reform, but I think I'm leaning more towards abolition. I just, the only reason why I kind of halt is because it's kind of like, so once we have the abolition, what would the the new system be in place? Like a lot of people have been talking about like community. Um, I don't know if any of y'all watched um, this, uh, it's like a live stream called Abolitionist Teaching. And I think that was really informative in terms of understanding like how you could put abolitionist practices in the education system, particularly uh, from K to 12. Um, but even then it's kind of, I, they're still kind of working in a capitalist society, if that makes sense, while they're also trying to overthrow it. So it's just like, I'm kind of rambling too, but that's kind of the things that's like in my head is like, what would be the aftermath or what, would, what, what do we want for um, the aftermath of whatever we're trying to burn down that is not only thinking about black people, but also thinking about everybody in general. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I see Nikkei. Um, yeah, this is a difficult question. Very hard, but I think reform still leaves room for white supremacy. Um, I think, well, to call it what it is, capitalism leaves room for white supremacy. So, at this point, I'm more, I do believe I'm on more of a road of, of like abolish, but I don't know. But like, I think really what I'm trying to think about is like, which system first? Like, you know, because like, definitely it's not something that like, we can all just like, like everything could just happen right, like just at once. And like, people are really afraid of the word anarchy because they just think that every, anything that isn't the current system is, anar is anarchy. But I feel like as though, as we move from system to system to then try and abolish the obvious white supremacy that continues because this country is born from it, I think that's the only way for black people to even reimagine themselves. And, or not, to re not for them to reimagine themselves, let me like change that, but for like, black people to be seen differently amongst a bunch of things including because I'm really just thinking about like the backwards things like under the law like there's some things that are just so inherently racist that like unless you do away with them nothing will happen you know like amendments were formed to reform a system to apparently make it not racist but it still is so like that's why you know history always repeats itself unless you do something to actively stop it and I think this country for too long has been constantly doing things to try and just like retroactively push a solution, like just to keep pushing for like, not pushing for a solution, but pushing back a solution in order to try and like appease the current state. Um, I think Bard did that. I think Bard continues to do that. They did it for Simon's Rock. They let themselves be visible for a mere second in order for us to somewhat feel safe, but I, I did not feel safe. But like, I think once again, like holding institutions strictly accountable and whatever means that is and actually working to figure out which system to abolish first. And that's not just one system at a time, it could be many, but like which ones do we push our energy towards? If that's one dismantling, if that's dismantling the police, dismantling like, how banks loan to different to different minority groups because they do because it is targeted even if that is dismantling homophobia transphobia within a community within our community itself i think that in order 
for there to any to be any change i think they're just yeah i'm just gonna say abolish before i was like teetering i'm just gonna say it yeah there is a quote that you gave me when our, our freshman year at Nikkei, where you said history doesn't repeat itself it rhymes and i've always really appreciated that and i really appreciate you saying that right now that like we do have to put a stick in the way that things go in order for things to stop rhyming um yeah thank you all for trying to answer that question for answering my question i really really do appreciate it and i am also really excited by this thought in general i'm really excited that all of you exist i'm really excited that you all that we have like such beautiful minds in general in this space and talking to each other um and I'm really honored that you guys gave your voices to me today. And you're honestly like your labor. I know this is tiring to talk about over and over again. And it means a lot to me that you've given me this, that you've, given, that you've allowed yourselves to come into the space um, and speak on this. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so for the last 20 minutes, we are going to have a Q&A with the rest of the audience. Um, and yeah, I think we have one question already. Is my, is my panel ready? Do you need a second to decompress, to breathe, water? Okay. See, Tehran's face tells me that we should just go, so I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> um, so first we have a question from our own Bard College professor um Kwame Holmes which is um in my abolishing prisons and the police I propose the abolition of grading the logic of grading is one and the same with the logic of criminal justice guilty f innocent a racial hierarchy white perfection black failure um and students were broadly disinterested in letting go of the hierarchy of grades how can abolition happen systemically when we struggle to enact it on a micro level Kwame says, sorry for the long question, but what do y'all think? I see Nika is ready. When reading this question, I can't help but think of the debacle that happened last semester with the universal A policy, how you saw predominantly white students basically believing that their success and their grade is worth more than people of color literally not having resources to succeed. And I think that was just a, a blatant example of what you're mentioning, how like even grades create a hierarchy in like, like we're all part, like it's, it was ridiculous. Like seeing there, watching this, being on a big town hall, having someone try and explain to me that them getting into med school is worth more than like someone else just like because like a lot of things work like in order to maintain your scholarships you have to have you have to have a certain gpa in order to like participate in some activities and a lot of these things are really helpful to poc just surviving on this campus and the fact that that was easily thrown away in order to better as well as the just blatant not like non-thought for the community in a whole and just for themselves I just think I don't know I just kind of wanted to throw that situation out there because I think this really that really perfectly goes to your question as to why people are so like why people were just or don't want to dismantle the hierarchy because they believe they're on top of it and like letting people and like that was a really interesting way of like confronting people my friends included who believed they were like who who tried to like expl desperately explain to me why them continuing to suppress other people is fine but yeah yeah absolutely. Yeah, no. yeah go ahead <laughs> no i was just gonna say because that was the exact point i was gonna bring up nikkei because 
just seeing that like you couldn't even let it go for a semester so imagine when we talk about being accounts for abolishing things and it's funny because some of those same people were like abolish the police but i'm like you couldn't even abolish the great system for a semester and you're talking about abolish the police how does your politics fit in and it was like the disconnect and the dissonance from that i'm like how do you not see those as the same things um so i just feel like people really can't start to understand it so they can see there are other ways when we talk about getting rid of some of these systems because in some ways they're for certain things but it's like on, on such a small scale you can't let certain things go so when you continue to uphold these systems it's just it's really wild for me to see and it's fascinating because i'm like do you not how do you not see that these are the same thing is and that they they intersect um but yeah, I feel like that is such a good place to start because people really show their asses with things like that because I don't understand how people think grades really determines who they are as a person. Cause like people were talking about getting to med school, but I'm like, what does a 4.0 GPA or you always getting A's have to do with you being a shitty doctor? If you're racist, if you're not empathetic, if you have nothing, if you don't even know the basic biology of a human body, but yet because you can have the grades on paper, like that, that still doesn't take away from that. So your grades to me mean nothing. Incredible answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. I feel like that almost answers. Nikkei had, um, I just love Nikkei, but also Nikkei said something earlier during, um, <laughs> as you were speaking about like when we're talking about abolition, what goes first? And yeah, you both are bringing an incredible point that we tried for abolition for one semester, not even like the end of a semester. And that was the response that we got. And um, it sounds like also from that question that the idea of abolition even for this semester is not attractive and breaking down why that is or why people feel that way personally I think it's really important um you're right it does show your ass <laughs> thank you um all right so we have our next question is from Mark Horowitz um he said oh sorry actually would the audience members um, put in their pronouns or rename themselves with their pronouns so I know what to address you by. That would be really cool. I'm going to go with they, them for Mark Horowitz for now. Um, but thank you. What a thoughtful panel. Thank you all. Central question. Is the struggle, whether reform or revolutionary, one for Black people specifically or for humanity as a whole? And if for Black people specifically, where do Black pro-capitalist voices fit in? Um, for example, Thomas Sowell, Sowell um, Shelby Steele, and Ben Carson. I'm going to hand this question off to Adrian. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it is 100% it is in the interest of every single person in humanity that Blackness be liberated. Um, and I think that this kind of goes back to um, what I was hinting at earlier is that um, when, when white people are, when white people maneuver society, American society, what have you, um, they have an instant, they have an, they have support from the institution that is, uh, kind of presenting them with a facetious kind of image of the world that is like built towards their privilege and comfort. And that is a illegitimate and unreal, like, view of the world. It's not real, you know? Like, it's just white supremacy, you know, flying potatoes in, in, your, in front of your face to make you think that potatoes fly, you know? It's, it's and I think that it, it is the, it is the, it's the fakeness that exists that, that, that's inherent in like white people's view of the world. And I think that the opposite of that is, is blackness and is truth and is, in, and is seeing the, and is perceiving the world and it's all of its objectivity and, and internalizing that. And so it is 100%, you know, in the interest, excuse me, in the interest of everyone to uh, pursue that truth and pursue the truth um, of the world. 
Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. I feel like it does. I think that makes sense. Yeah, Bernie, please. <laughs> hey, um, from when I think of like, you know, black capitalists, right? The first thing that came to my head when I was thinking about your question is that like, let's say that we do allow, you know, like capitalism, capitalism to sustain itself and we allow like the liberation of black people in order to gain the benefits of capitalism. For me, the way that I think about it is that there won't be any liberation because then a new group of people will be oppressed or we're going to ignore, um, like, let me backtrack. One, we're going to oppress new people. And also two, there are people, um, black people who are benefiting from capitalism. But as you can see, there's a wide variety of people, black, other POCs, even white people who are still, you know, dying, not having the resources, as you said, like Bard is poor, you know what I mean? Like, and I know, like, we we're talking about like the fact that Bard, like, you know, a lot of POC spaces are not getting a lot of the resources that they need, but also thinking about like Bard doesn't have a lot of money to begin with, but then also thinking about how much money from our government is going towards education in general and what is going towards other things that is supporting corporations. So to me, it's like, I don't think that there will be any sort of liberation if we sustain capitalism at all. And even if we have liberation of black people, we're going to still have immigrants be exploited. We're still going to have lower class individuals being exploited. And unless we fix those systems, once we fix those issues, there won't be any capitalism. So to me, I, I understand what you're going for. And like, yeah, Ben Carson, do what you do, but you doing what you do while other people like me are struggling to survive. And I don't think that's... A, I don't think that's all right. I don't think that's okay. And where do they fit? I don't think they fit because I don't think capitalism fits, in my opinion. Um, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Bernie with these amazing answers. Damn. <laughs> really? Um, does anybody else want to take a try at that question as well? Also, really quickly, um, we have our final speaker here, Kahan Sablo, um, <laughs> who he is Dean of Inclusive Excellence on campus. And Kahan, we are in the last few minutes of questions, so you're absolutely welcome to um, weigh in, add your perspective, commentary, anything um, you feel necessary to the conversation. Um, and yeah, please. <laughs> Okay, great. We were, um, we were just answering Mark Horowitz's question in the chat, um, which was, is the struggle one for Black people or specifically one for humanity as a whole? Um, and, if black people, and if for Black people specifically, where do Black capitalist voices fit? Which you heard Bernie's amazing answer. Um, and yeah, if nobody else would like to answer that question, we can move on. We have another question from Mark Mooney. Okay, great. All right. So we have the question from Mark Mooney is, does Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa ideology resonate with anybody on the panel? Does it land differently today amidst all that is going on? Okay, I see Tehran. No, it does not resonate with me. Um, Okay, I don't care for Pan-Africanism as much as other people do. I think that on one hand, while we are, as Black people, descendants of Africa, I think that one, because of white supremacy and slavery, none of us niggas know where we're from, if we're gonna be completely honest. If you do, great. But a lot of us in America, at least, or even like in other Black countries throughout the diaspora, don't necessarily know where they stem from in Africa, right? If we want to talk about a globalized conversation. So like even going back to Africa, the ideology in itself is cute, but it's not necessarily realistic because one, we're hundreds of years removed from the ideologies of these specific countries. Because even when we say back to Africa, we're in Africa. Where do white people, where do the white person take us from? You know what I mean? So it's like, where exactly are you going back to? And like, is it appropriate to go back to a place where you're not culturally from? And that gets into the idea of like cultural appropriation and appreciation between black people in itself. Like, is it appropriate to say, oh, like, even though I'm, I'm a 
black descended person should i step into someone else's culture just because of the fact that i'm black and um i don't i mean my ideology about it hasn't changed um based on the social climate uh i do think that like there are like, I know, I think it was like ludicrous or something. Like a few of the people like got citizenships to like, like, I don't know if, I don't, I don't, I'm like, not 100% certain, but I remember seeing like this huge thing about like specifically African-Americans that were like trying to go back to Africa. And while I thought, Libya, okay, cool. Thank you, Sage. Um, while I thought it was a vibe for them, um, I think that there is, there's one there's too much history within like just the idea of like being descended from africa like, like there's so much there's hundreds of years of gap that sh it won't it just doesn't make sense and then also too like i also think that this is a personal thing of mine but i think that the idea of pan-africanism is stemmed within like black people not necessarily valuing and appreciating their culture within America or black culture within like their specific communities because I think a lot of times in that conversation there are ideas of like black people not having culture when in reality we see multiple twos of times people will copy black culture black American culture black Caribbean culture you know cultures that are like like unique to white people and I think that um it's just not like I don't think that it's beneficial. Um, but again, rev like revolution and abolition looks different to black people, but I don't necessarily see um, validity within going back to Africa. But it's also like, where can we go? So, you know, you know, but yeah. Um, I see Kahan had a finger. I think that very circumstance that the brother was just mentioning points out the long-term trauma of a people who have been captured and brought to another country against their will. The end product of that is we are Africans without the history there, and we're Americans without the privileges of being American. So when you snatch people out of another land and you move them to another place and put them through all of what we've been through, this is what happens. We, as the brother was saying, we don't personally are, we're generations removed from the motherland. So to walk over there, they would look at us, you're American. Why, why? Yes, we honor your black skin, but you have been raised in American culture. You don't, you don't speak the language. You don't do those things that are near and dear to us. So walking over there could be a problem. Yet we sit in a land that clearly doesn't want us, doesn't treat us with respect um, as we look at all of the shootings and the, and the destruction of a Black Wall Street and all those other historical things that have happened. So that is the damage of being stolen from some place that our history gets, to place and his, history gets displaced and we're unloaded in a place that never really wanted us for good reasons. We were brought here for the purposes of slavery. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, cause um, earlier in the panel, I was like, um, if racists gave me the money and could tell me where I'm from, I would happily go back to Africa. And I wanna be clear that I said that jokingly. Um, <laughs> cause I do, I consider myself an American descendant of slavery and I definitely hope that with pride, I joke about that with my Caribbean friends all the time um, because I have no idea where I'm from. I mean, according to ancestry, I have roots in Nigeria and Cameroon, but do I know anything about those cultures? Absolutely not. Um, the only thing I know, my history begins with um, indentured servants um, who my great grandmother was in Mississippi. That's what I know and that's what I proudly claim. Um, claim. So um, for me, when I hear things like that, because I there are so many issues within the diaspora and especially in the way in which other countries look upon black Americans. Um, and that's a whole nother thing to unpack in itself. But also as Teron was saying, just getting into like appropriation versus appreciation and things like that. Like I, I rather 
took pride in my culture here um, and understand that more and how that looks and unraveling that um, and sharing that with people as opposed to trying to fit myself into something I have never really been able to resonate with. Um, and I, that really hasn't changed um, since everything has started. I feel like I want to leave America, but not because I necessarily want to go to Africa and try to fit in there. I just, I don't want to be here, uh, but you know, what does that look like? If we, if black Americans can start another country, I'm for it. Um, so yeah, I would, I would rather that than just me trying to go um, to Africa and, and get into a place where I don't fit in, like get in where you fit in, but I don't fit in there. Um. While listening to see the person that asked the question mark, Mina says, thank you, Tehran, Kahan, and Talaya. Um, so we're at the end of our panel. And I do want to open it up to maybe one more question before we end. Um, but I think I may also have a question for you all, now that I was thinking about your answers, and also my own. Oh, yeah, sorry, did I miss? Nika, go ahead. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's fine. Um, I just wanted to say, because, like, I definitely never thought of that before listening to you three, because, like, as someone who does have the privilege of knowing exactly, like, where my family is from, because they did immigrate here from Nigeria, I, like, I just wanted to thank you, because that's something that I honestly never thought of. But then I'm also just down just for, like, yeah, like, if you can find, like, like Talia was joking about earlier, if you know exactly if if racists will pay me and you know where they're from, I think, because I think back to when earlier in the summer when things were going on with George Floyd, literally the Ghanaian government was like, please come back. Like, we want you to experience. We want you to learn. We want you to figure out. And like, I just kind of think of that in <laughs> and like I just kind of think of that and I'm like I definitely do now like before I would have I think before you guys spoke I definitely would have been I would have resonated more with Garvey's Back to Africa but to think about that like the that like black Americans do have their own distinct culture that is very different and I know that because my households are split down the middle but like I I think it is different today because I think kind of I feel like black Americans I feel like we've like legitimized our own culture versus when it when Marcus Garvey was writing like was writing that initial theory the cult like the culture itself was still yet to be named understood and really like legitimized by themselves you know so like I think it would definitely look different today, almost, but, like, I, yeah, I just kind of wanted to bring that point, because I never really thought about that as someone who does have the privilege, the opportunity, and absolutely knows where I'm from, so, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, thank you. I'm actually so glad that everyone brought you to my attention, because that would have been a really interesting point that we would have missed had you not spoken. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, Bernie. Um, I see there's another comment in the chat. Um, so yeah, it's now, it's not 7.33. Um, I think, how do you all feel about one more question, if there is one, before we end? Okay. This is, audience, this is your last chance. It's a very valuable time, very valuable people you have here. Going once, going twice. All right, and we will end with that. Um, I think before we go, I also wanted to, because I know we have a, we have a lot of intersections um, present here at this panel, but I also wanted to bring attention to a point that Bernie brought up earlier that when black women speaks, humanity speaks. And the idea of like the most, when the most marginalized is brought up, that is the point where capitalism fall away. That's that is the point where subjugation itself falls away. And I know it just it seems important to also bring up like the idea of 
black trans women really being the ones at the bottom of that hierarchy, if that exists. Um, Cause I think we also see, and this is probably, this is another panel on its own, but when also thinking of these ideas that you all have brought up for what even anyone's utopia or a black utopia or anyone's utopia kind of has to come at the expense of somebody else. And I think I may have been problematic and even like the way that I frame these questions as like a generalization of what do you as a black person want when really we're all at the intersections of a lot of different things. And I see that like, I'm the same ways that a lot of black trans women are murdered by people within our own community quite often um, would complicate that question pretty considerably. And I think Talaya and Nika kind of brought that up in wanting a non, a non cis male, um, a cis black utopia and same with Tehran. Um, and it, it is a point that I wish we kind of gotten into a little bit further, but I hope I can still see you guys later and we can talk about it later. But, um, but yeah, I think I want to say thank you so much, all of you, for coming. You all are the smartest, coolest people I know. <laughs> and this is just affirmed that for me. Um, and I want to say thank you to the audience for coming. Um, I know we have a lot of different experiences also represented in the audience, so it means a lot that you all are here and willing to listen. Um, and I hope you take from this not that you want to go to more panels with Black people on it, but want to go to less panels with Black people on it because some of the issues that we're talking about have been resolved or that you're working to resolve them in your own life. Um, I hope that you implicate yourselves in this struggle in the biggest possible way. And yeah, I think we have one more message from our sponsor, the Hannah Current Center. And Roger, are you there? Uh, yeah. Hi, Sky, And um, thank you all. This was a, a fantastic conversation and panel. Um, really appreciate uh, all the thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 sec the, the series that you guys just kicked off is called Race and Revolution. Um, strikes me that a third, I mean, the, the, the conversation often went around reform and abolition. And I kept wondering where revolution fit in with that and that. But that's a question that I hope will keep coming up. Um, we have about eight different um, events coming up in the next three months. I hope you'll come back. I hope so, some of the speakers, but all of the audience will as well. And the next one actually is Monday um, at three o'clock. Um, is it three o'clock, Sky? I think at three o'clock, mm -hmm. um, if I have that correctly. Um, uh, and it's with uh, Coleman Hughes, who's a... Uh, who graduated Columbia University last year. So he's a contemporary of, of many of you. Um, and he's sort of become a, I mean, I think with the question that somebody asked about black capitalists was somewhat a thing of a question about black conservatives uh, to where do they stand? And I think he would to some degree fit into that category. So I think it will be a very challenging and interesting question um, uh, for him. And I hope you guys come and, um, ask him hard questions and uh, engage with him because he's become a, a really, um, he's become a big spokesperson for, for a viewpoint that I think uh, um, a lot of you will find um, challenging. So uh, it's co-sponsored with the Tough Talks program and the Race and Revolution series. And it's Monday at three o'clock and I hope you'll, you'll join us. And after that is, um, uh, Juliana Huxtable and, and Kimberly Foster and, and then Bill T. Jones. So we have some great lectures coming up and I uh, hope you'll join us for those. Thanks all very much. And thank you, Sky and, and all the panelists. Thank you. And right before we end, um, just want to say really fast, can our panelists put their Venmos in the chat? <laughs> just in case anybody in the audience um, wants to tip them for their labor tonight. Um, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. This conversation has been recorded so you can um, look at this at any point in time. And I want to say thank you to Roger for helping me put this together and the Hannah Arendt Center for funding this project and this idea of mine um, and giving me resources to make this happen. Um, and I appreciate and I also want to say thank you to the Black community at Bard in general. You all have been amazing to me and in educating me and being my friends. Um, so.
so yeah, that is the end of this panel. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all for participating. And I hope you have a great night.